All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Melissa Raspberry, and I'm with the American Institutes for Research. And we have the honor and pleasure of being the manager and facilitators of the CS for All Teachers community. And so we're glad to have you with us here tonight. Um, for those that aren't able to join us live, we are recording this session, so it can be accessed later. Um, and um, we hope that uh, you will um, appreciate and enjoy the conversation and resources that will be shared, because I'm sure it's always, it's going to be great. It always is with this group of folks we have with us. I do just ask that if you um, are listening in and aren't speaking directly, that you please mute your line. I'm going to do that myself in just a moment, just to cut back on any background noise that we may have. Um, we do really, really hope that you will, Julia, ask questions. Let's have some conversation here. So don't be shy. Um, you're welcome to add things in the chat window, as you've already done. But we hope you'll also um, raise those questions and ideas verbally as well. Um, so um, I'll be back and listening and watching um, in the background. So if there's any issues you um, have or trouble that uh, happens throughout the webinar, you're welcome to send me a message and I can help to troubleshoot that for you. But in the meantime, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Gail, who will be leading our discussion tonight. So thank you, Gail. All right. Thank you, Melissa. And uh, welcome, everybody. Um, greetings from Chicago. I thought that we needed to have representation of all the time zones that are not Alaska and Hawaii on the panel tonight. And so I came to Chicago just to make sure that happened. Um, so I, I want to um, start by just going over the agenda very quickly. Um, this is the welcome. And I'm going to introduce, actually have the panelists introduce themselves momentarily. Um, talk a bit about the, um, the structure of the um, webinar will be to have each of the panelists talk about um, a project or two that they've used in their class successfully um, for global impact and or interdisciplinary connections. Um, these overviews will be very short. But then um, we'll move on, and I will ask some questions about the use of those projects in the classrooms and potentially modifying those projects for use in other courses. And then, um, as always, we'll want additional ideas from folks in the audience. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And um, we can start with. Um, Nicole? See. Am I unmuted, I hope? Now you are, yes. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So my name is Nicole Wright Larson. I teach in Salt Lake City, Utah. I teach at West High School. We have a great range of students from 7th to 12th grade, and I teach all those ranges, but mostly I teach ninth through 12th, and I teach exploring computer science. So I've been able to teach this class with all of the students in the school, usually in the 10th and 11th grade. So I have a broad spectrum from my ESL students, my special ed students, my average regular ed kid, my IB students, and AP students, all in the same class. And so we have a lot of fun in exploring computer science, talking about how innovation affects them and how it affects those around them who they communicate with on social media. All right. Thanks, Nicole. And Art? Yeah. Hi. My name is Art Lopez. And I teach at Sweetwater High School in National City, California. And I teach AP Computer Science Principles. I've taught this course now. This is the fifth year that I'm teaching the course. I was one of the pilot instructors for the College Board's AP Computer Science Principles. And I'm really excited about being able to talk about this topic. I think it's one of the interest, most interesting ones for our kids to learn. And I teach 9th through 12th graders, as Nicole does. And I'm all about broadening participation, getting young women and ethnically diverse students to think about computer science as something to pursue in their future. And I'm also about open, I mean, uh, open access and equity access 
because the the school that I work in has about an 88 percent free reduced lunch programs and we also are about 98 percent ethnically diverse and I'm just about letting kids get exposed to computer science and maybe they'll want to be a computer scientist one day. Okay, thank you, Art and Keisha. Good evening, my name is Keisha Tennessee and I teach in Henrico County, Virginia at the Advanced Career Education Center at Hermitage. It is an admission-based program. I teach only 11th and 12th graders. Um, I teach web design and programming in which exploring computer science is embedded within the structure of the curriculum as it stands. And that concludes my introduction. All right, thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to ask each of the panelists to um, go over briefly their project, uh, the course that it's used in, key features of the project or lesson, um, additional sources of, sources of information used for the project and lesson, and any resources that might be necessary. So we'll just keep going in the same order, I think. All right, so the project that I chose is from Unit 1 of Exploring Computer Science. And the activity goes along with lesson days 17 through 19, What is Intelligence, where we talk to the students about computers being smart, not smart, can we tell the difference between a computer or not? And after we do some of the basic activities where the students do kind of like the Turing test and a couple of things, I have them come up with smart technologies. And they have to explain to the class, after they do a little research, what makes the technology smart. So they have to kind of go online, do some research, um, find an image that they can bring in and then describe what makes that item smart and how they would um, explain it to someone who maybe was like frozen back in time and they come into time now, what makes this thing so awesome and cool. And they have about a two to three minutes to do like a little flash chat with us about what they researched and what makes it smart. And so then they have to kind of do a little write-up as well. What are some of the advantages of the type, that type of smart technology? What are some disadvantages? And then how can that change kind of their situation or life? How does it affect them and those around them or in another community? Hi, uh, this is Art Lopez, and I teach AP Computer Science Principles. And I'm going to try to share my screen with everybody. <laughs> All right, go ahead and keep talking. I'm uploading your PowerPoint now. You there, Art? Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Now we yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I think you can see my. Can you see my, but the PowerPoint scaffolding PT Explorer. Yep. Okay. So this is a, so what we have to do in AP, uh, AP uh, computer science principle is we have to go ahead and do a performance task called explore and we teach the big idea called uh, global impact and what in part of this is and I'm hoping that I'll be able to use this is that we have to require kids to choose a computing innovation that they're going to have to research and so what we try to get the kids to do is to think of a computing creation that actually revolutionizes or just changes the way we do things. And so what we try to use as examples is think about innovations that's impacted the economy, society, and or a culture. So one of the things that I tell them that revolutionized computing is like, for example, the iPod. 
And so we go through a series of different types of innovations that occur over the past 20 years. But what we try to tell them to do is try to select a recent innovation that they're familiar with. So recently, what we use, what we try to do within the scope of what we're trying to teach is we try to have the kids think of these following questions. What are the beneficial effects of the innovation? How did it help society, the economy, or culture? They just have to pick one of those three things about the harmful effects because we also want them to think about that computing inherently, it's, it's not good or bad. It's just that sometimes the impacts without the realization of the people that create these things is that they can have beneficial or they can have harmful effects. And then we really want to talk about data processing, which is about how the innovation inputs, transforms, and output the information that it's receiving. And these are three key questions they have to answer in the scope of doing the performance task explore. So one of the things that we've done is we do an example with Pokemon Go. We explain what the beneficial effects were in, from our opinion about what Pokemon Go was, also about the harmful effects. So one of the beneficial effects is like people claim that it created science of community with strangers. It was a fun pastime that got people to walk and exercise. But some of the harmful effects was that people were interrupting the processes of their life. And they were actually things like life-threatening accidents that were occurring or they were putting themselves in dangerous uh, situations when they're trying to catch and play Pokemon. So what was the data processing? We went ahead and discussed, well, what do you have to use? You have to use GPS, your video information, storage. How does it capture it and using virtual reality? So it has a really, this example that we came up with really helped us to explain to the kids all of these different effects and the, also the data processing that was involved. What was really cool about it is that we actually show examples of how we would do this within Google and we use Google Docs to do this and we showed them how to use this tool called Explore within the Google Docs and how to research for information and how to do online citations when they were supposed to ans answer this, this series of questions that we were giving them so that they can explain what the innovation was about and how it was impacting it on a global scale. So uh, the other thing that we also include is we have to have the kids create uh, an inf uh, some sort of computer artifact. So we try to encourage them to create an infographic using Canva, Prezi, or some other kind of infographic program that they choose to select to use. And we ask them to also create videos so they can explain one of some of these uh, innovations that they're researching. And one of the things that we actually use is TED Technology. The TED Talks has a technology feature. We have kids research in there and think about other fields that are using computing innovation. So they look in the medical field, they'll look in engineering, they'll look at uh, agriculture. They'll use it, they, they can look at any other field that they think that there's a computing innovation that is involved that they never would have even thought of. And this lends itself really well to thinking about global impact on different interdisciplines. Uh, inter interdisciplinary fields, and we also talk about communication and collaboration as they're doing this task. And I am going to right now stop sharing. Uh, oh, one last thing: we base this uh, this uh, this lesson on the rubric that's provided by the College Board, and we list these as criteria so that when we score their uh, the uh, the computer artifact that they turned in and also the report with online citations to give them a sense of how they were going to be able to score when they actually do the performance task at a later date. Okay, thank you, Art. And now, um, Keisha, if you would like to share an overview of your project or lesson, that would be great. Um, yes, thank you, Gail. Um, one project that I was going to first highlight, Nicole has already beat me to it because I really love that project, but it's okay. I have a backup. Um, one project I would like to <laughs> highlight is a cumulative project that I am revamping but went really, really well last year, which is um, an app development project that starts off with students watching a PBS documentary on the digital nation, which shows the impact that technology has had within our lives and in our workplace and just any element of our society today. 
And with that being said, then they begin to research some of the apps or social media tools that they use on an everyday basis. And they take their knowledge and understanding of that and then think about it in a global and community way of what type of app that they could develop to solve a problem. So tying in unit two. Um, and from with that component, they then think about the data analysis. I also tie in another PBS documentary on the generation light, which shows how um, we are freely giving off data as we participate in Facebook or Instagram or things of that nature. So now corporations and companies kind of reduce their costs because we are freely just providing them all of their resources. Um, and so sort of like Art says with students researching current innovation, then they're taking it and thinking about what could they create um, that would provide a benefit to society, but also looking at the benefits and any adverse effects that it may have on computing. It's also a collaborative project that they work on with a neighboring high school that's within our school building, which is the marketing class that requires students to also use some of those online collaboration tools. Um, students have to email with each other. They have to make sure all the teachers are CC'd on there to teach email etiquette. They do Google Hangouts or Zoom to do online meetings as well. Um, it's a lot of reflection and journal questions throughout the present um, project. And then at the end, we do like a Shark Tank presentation in which the students present their projects or their pretty much their apps, along with their marketing team to um, our investors, which are normally our administrators, instructional technology resource team, and some of our specialists. Wow. I want to hear more about that last part <laughs> um, as we move on with the uh, um, questions that I'm going to ask specifically um, of each of you. Um, so starting with um, evaluating and providing feedback on the student work in order to emphasize the global impact and connections. And I'm actually going to start in reverse order here with you, um, Keisha, because I have an additional question uh, for you, which is related to the, um, the shark tank. Could you uh, not only explain that a little bit further, but also talk about how you evaluate that and provide feedback, because um, I think that's a really um, interesting idea. I want to. Um, yes, sure. So the first year that the teacher and myself, who also um, that I'm collaborating with, um, we use just a um, an application a standard rubric far as the product itself and our presentation rubrics that we use in house for our normal presentations. We are revamping some of that um, to make sure that students are scaffolded and giving additional time to practice and rehearse. Um, so the layout of the Shark Tank or how it will be embodied this year is that the marketing team will actually go in and they will present their projects as though they are marketing firms. And then you have the developers, which are my students. And similar to what would take place in society today, you have an idea of what can be done to improve something or enhance something. But of course, you need your data to support it, and you need to be able to articulate your thoughts and your ideas. So my students will go into the marketing firm, which are some of the marketing students, which we will already have grouped the students. Um, this year, I am doing a gender group to see if there is some relevance between gender and ideas, creativities, and details that are set within um, computer science field altogether because I do have six students, six female students out of a total of 16 in my first year class. Um, and so those students who work with the marketing students to first just collaborate. So the way we will assess and evaluate that is through peer evaluation, um, informal conversations. Typically, I always will have informal conversations with whomever is the project manager of that app and just get their feedback. Part of having the students make sure the teachers are copied on the email is to also be able to monitor and assess how they're communicating with each other, 
how they're handling and establishing norms and expectations, which that is something we will go over with the students as well. Um, when it's time to actually do the presentation, we would have already have asked our administrators and other stakeholders to come in to our library. We would have it set up with the projector and students will present um, and there will be a holding area for all the other students. This year we have decided to record the presentations to allow students even the opportunities to go back and review their presentation skills um, regarding their communication, body language, and things of that nature. We will also extend the prototype of their app to my seniors to provide feedback throughout the project, project to give critique um, constantly so students can receive that feedback as they're working on it. I hope that answers your question. Well, yeah, well, yeah it does. <laughs> Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Art? Yeah, so what, what we do is we uh, to start the project, we tell the kids that we want them to explore something that they're interested in terms of a computing innovation and how it's impacted one of uh, three things, the economy, the uh, society, or culture. And the way, coming quick. The, and the way we uh, evaluate and provide feedbacks to our students is that we go ahead and provide them a rubric at the beginning. And when we start looking at the innovations and the questions that they're trying to answer, we start asking them to work with their, with their partner or work in a group. And they take the rubric and they just start evaluating each other's work. They start providing feedback on each other and see if they are meeting the criteria as is set in the rubric. And what we're hoping that they will be able to learn is that they, they start reading very clearly what the rubric is about and what the criteria is requiring them to do in terms of completing the performance task and or in this case, you know, a miniature performance task. What we're also trying to emphasize is the global impact of computing, that computing is involved in all different fields. And we have kids that have never, you know, they start looking. Well, what's really curious is when they start researching and looking through the videos in the TED Talks technology, and they start looking at different computing innovations in fields that they never even expected there to be a an impact from a computing innovation and that's really cool and they end up teaching not only themselves new things they end up teaching me new things which is really empowering and it's really cool and what we start thinking they start making connections is that they start having the realization that no matter what they're going to pursue in the future computing is going to play an important role a role because that's how the world is we're driven by computers computational thinking and computer tools and the thing is, is that when they start uh, creating their computer artifacts so that they can describe the innovation and how the data is inputted, how it's transformed and how it's outputted and doing those descriptions, they have to clearly explain it to others so that they can get their ideas across in a concise and clear way. And so what they end up doing is they practice a lot with each other and they start creating these artifacts and they start using it, the rubrics again. They start grading each other and seeing that they actually meet the, the criteria set in the rubric. And they also look at the, at the artifact that their peers are creating and see if it actually explains what the innovation is about and the impact it may be having on society, economy, or culture. And it's a really great and fun uh, project that my kids get really involved in. They get to, at the end, you know, they get to display and show to the rest of the class the infographics they created. They show them the videos that they created. And it turns out to be a really great way for them to prepare for the performance task, explore for the AP computer science principles class. All right, thank you. Nicole? All right, one thing that I do, this. With this activity, it is in Unit 1. So in Unit 1, it's probably around, I would say, October, November time when we do this activity. So students are still fairly 
new to working in groups. They're fairly new to presenting. A lot of students don't like standing up in front of others. So when we talk, or at least when I think about evaluating and giving feedback, for this type of activity, because it's just is just like I mentioned, a kind of a flash chat, just two or three minutes where they show this smart thing that they come up with and how smart is it, how does it affect technology and the world around them. And after they share it, um, we do glows and grows. So what things people write down, like one or two things that they really liked about it. And I give sentence stems to my students because a lot of them struggle with giving feedback in a positive way. So we have some sentence stems on the board. Um, of ways they can say, I really like the way you did this, or this was something that I've never thought about. And then we give them ways to help them grow. Have you, and one of those might be, have you ever thought about, or did you consider, or another thing that they might say is, I'm really interested in learning more about something else. And so they give them glows and grows, and they write it on stickies. And then at the end of their presentation, um, I have one piece of kind of chart paper for each student and the people as they kind of leave for the day, they put up their stickies on the chart paper so that I can save that and then I can give each student their chart paper the next day in class. So it's not a big huge thing where everyone gets to see people's comments for this first unit. As we progressively go throughout the year, I give more space for there to be open feedback and communication on people's thought processes and stuff like that. But for this first unit, we really try to keep it a safe space for students to share their ideas and to want to get up and present. Um, with the connections that we make in class, a lot of the students think that when they come in to exploring computer science, they know everything about computers. And what they discover is that they know a lot about social media or they know a lot about getting online, but maybe not how computers work or what computers have as limitations or why something is considered even a computer. So when they look at these smart technologies, it's a good way for them to just broaden their opinions and ideas. So I try to help them connect it with, hey, if you're really excited about PE, then find a smart technology that relates to PE. Is it really helpful? Is it not? What makes it smart? If you really love music, how can we find something that you really like about music and find a technology that people think that makes music creation more innovative or more efficient? So we really try to make connections with things they're interested in. So again, they have confidence to want to stand up and present in front of other people. Part of the impact of adding communication and collaboration with these kids in Unit 1 is it builds group work so that when they lead into Unit 2 of Exploring Computer Science, it's problem solving. And they've looked at how do computers work, what makes them smart, now how can we use computers to solve problems. And so it's a fun introduction into more complex activities. Um, but even just looking at how they give feedback with each other at the net Unit 1, I really try to keep it a safe space. Thanks, Nicole. I have um, one question. Do you have that um, your quest, your stems for glows and grows available? Yes, I can share them with the um, Google Doc that I just shared with yourself and Melissa earlier. I can add those okay. stems at the bottom because I that have be um, tried to create a great list of stems, and a lot of my students are English language learners, so this gives them a way to feel like they can share feedback if they don't know the language really well, or if I have students who are new to computer science, they're like, we don't know how computer scientists talk. And I'm like, well, that's part of being in this class, is we get to right. learn about different roles of computer scientists, so let's learn about their language. Great. That would be very helpful if you could add that. Much appreciated. OK, so I'm going to ask. Um, a few more questions related to um, the projects that you discussed. Um, any modifications you might make in order to use it in one of the other courses? So if you're teaching ECS, what might you do to, to um, add some complexity to make it um, useful for CS principles or CSA or something else? Um, any um, tweaks that you would suggest others make if they were to use it with their own students? And if 
you have other topics or resources you use for global impact and um, interdisciplinary connections, what are they? And um, so a brief description of those. So let's um, go back to Keisha here and then we'll see where we are. Um, yes, if someone else was to utilize this lesson, one thing that I would say is really important, kind of hitting on what Nicole just mentioned for its students' perception of their knowledge and understanding, is make sure that everything is clearly outlined of the expectations and give them numerous research question prompts to kind of guide them. We don't want to tell them what they need to find, but sometimes they can be very surface based. And I'm sure, especially as you get to the more complexity far as your AP computer science or CSP, that you may want to develop some more complex questions as far as their research component. Um, another thing is to make sure that they are constantly reflecting on the inquiry that is taking place. So making sure that they have journals each day that's related to progress and allowing them time to, you know, work on that time management skill. Um, and, a, and another thing, as far as just working with others and collaborating, using the tools that we currently have out there, I often like for students to utilize things that are different than what they are normally comfortable with because this is the opportunity to allow all students a room for growth. So oftentimes I prohibit students from using Microsoft PowerPoint. You know, that is like a crutch. I mean, we've used that time and time again. So when they're doing their multimedia presentations, they can do it on anything except for that. So you have students, then they're able to show the creativity behind computing. So you will have students that might create a Powtoon or use a Prezi that I also see mentioned in Art's um, presentation, or they might even make a YouTube video or things of that nature. You don't really want to limit their ideas, but you definitely want to make sure that they're getting the concepts that are required within that unit. So again, mine is a cumulative project that goes with unit one, human and computer interaction, to problem solving, to components within programming, and then computing and analysis all together. So it kind of streamlines um, the entire curriculum um, all together. I use MIT App Inventor. That's what we've used in the past, and it seemed to have worked really, really well. Um, depending on your school system and what devices you have, you may need to find something else because App Inventor, from my knowledge, does not work successfully with any Apple devices. So it's only an Android-abled um, software. And that is all that I have at the moment that's coming to mind for as changes modifications or insights. Do you want All right, thank you. Sorry. And Art? Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, uh, Keisha and, and both Nicole are describing some really great things with their projects with students in terms of scaffolding. Uh, I, I have the same issues in my classroom where I have a lot of kids that have never taken an AP course before. And some of the challenges I have, because I have a really large English language learner uh, population, is the challenge of trying to really improve their ability to write, but in a technical manner. So what I really try to practice is how to teach, how to implement, and, and I, I, I get help from the uh, English department and how I can go ahead and, to the best of my ability, get my kids to be able to write clearly and concisely. I, uh, that's, a, that's a really big challenge for us. So what we try to do during the, the scope of teaching that particular lesson, and I was going to modify it to do it for some other courses, I would really try to think about how to, how to use uh, writing prompts and how to help uh, guide students 
into learning about how to do well one do research you know when they're going what a lot of kids don't seem to understand is when they're going to write a you know college level research paper they don't understand they don't have to reinvent the wheel so you really have to you really have to do it like an apprenticeship sort of experience for them what i try to do is is look at an article online that's describing the computer in computing innovations and looking and the other thing is also guiding them on how to do effective searching within the scope of like in google what's the right keywords to ask in order to get information that i can use so you know we teach them how to use the word beneficial effects of whatever innovation that they're trying to research and then look at what's being written and then see if they can go ahead and rewrite it in such a way that they, they break it down into some really clear concise statements that are going to answer the questions in terms of, of what what we're asking them and the challenges is that they're trying to look at the criteria that's set forth before them and then they're trying to match that writing with what they're trying to get in terms of the information to someone that's going to be grading their papers and in and in regards to the computer artifact i i completely agree with keisha it's a really good idea not to use presentation software as a computer artifact because that's what the kids know and that's what they always use so it's great to make them go out of their comfort zone and there's a lot of like video capturing software that like like you know challenge kids to use uh, we use a interactive animated uh, programming platform called Alice. And sometimes I tell the kids, can you create a story based upon the innovation that you just learned about? And, and they try to code it. But that, that's pretty challenging as well. But I think the key point to all this is that you try to really scaffold, break down the, the lesson into small manageable problems that kids can feel really good at being able to be successful to meet the criteria that uh, that they're going to get graded on when they're doing these types of projects. Okay, Nicole, do you have anything you want to add? I just love hearing all these ideas. Um, these are best practices that I think all students would appreciate if teachers would scaffold their lessons and give them opportunity to learn how to be successful. So I just love hearing the ideas. Um, I think that any of the projects, well, Tanisha's project, or I can't, yeah. Um, the different projects that were mentioned for the ECS, I think could work for the computer science principles tasks as well. I think that the students need to have opportunities to try writing in different ways throughout the semester before they ever get to the end writing piece at the end of the year. So if these could be mini writing activities, they would work really well. Um, and Art, as Art said, connecting with other teachers. The language arts teacher is an awesome person to connect with to help match up, hey, what kind of writing style do you use? How can I help build on what you're doing in my class? Or do you want to come in and do like a mini demo with my students on writing? But helping students build that confidence is awesome. I really appreciate that. One thing that I have really um, thought about doing as well is helping students see that teachers do collaborate and in any career that they're going to have, collaborating, seeing where their skill sets go across different curriculums. So if they're doing some kind of web design class somewhere else or they're doing another class where they could take what they're doing with your project and apply it or help another teacher use what they're doing in class, it makes them want to invest more time in it. So definitely helping that out. That's all I would add. Thank you. So that was a lot of information. And um, I know there are others here who are um, have been listening patiently for <laughs> the last 45 minutes. And so I'd really like to hear from folks in the audience, any questions or additional project ideas that you might have? Well, 
Well, John, I'm glad that this was helpful. If you have any questions in the next couple of minutes, please feel free to fire away. Hey Gail, can can I uh, can I make a quick suggestion on on a uh, on a resource that's really cool for people to direct kids to sure. exploring computing innovations? The National Science Foundation um, has a I believe a newsletter called CS Bits and Bytes, and it is awesome. It's created by the fellows that work with the NSF. And they provide some really great um, um, newsletters, monthly newsletters, where they connect uh, computing innovations with different fields. And a lot of my kids really enjoy exploring that. And they get ideas for, uh, you know, doing an exploration of, of uh, you know, global impact of computing in other fields. So I think that's a great resource for people to use in their classroom. Can I just say thank you, Art, for that great suggestion, which reminds me of just the element of making sure that we really embed literacy and let students see how all of the core curriculums are integral parts of computer science. So having students, you know, direct them to reading sources. I know I've had students read Blown to Bits as snippets or chapters that coincide with the learning objectives, or even with the discussion of working with our language arts teachers, of making sure that students understand formatting of papers, MLA, APA, or margins, or even work cited, and the difference between work, uh, your reference pages, and all those things that students can apply the skills that they're learning in some of their other classes, that they see how they all relate within computer science. This is Nicole, can I add something as well? I always think it's good to bring in current events. There's so much going on with current events. If you wanna talk about privacy, you wanna talk about innovation, you wanna talk about um, using coding to make life better, or how do we solve problems with technology. I think that there's so many things out there that if we help kids see that they don't have to be a master coder or a master computer scientist, but as long as they know how to use the computer as a tool to solve problems, that they can do so Gail? many things in their life. They can make school easier. They can make their job easier. That's great. Does anyone else have anything they want to add from the audience? Julia added a um, link, teachglobalimpact.org. Um, and apparently it is CS principles centered. Mm -hmm. um, but I imagine that there are probably also ways that those things could be adapted for use in um, other courses. Yeah, indeed. I mean, it's, it's so basically we actually take stuff from ACM computing news and various other things, um, just provide a summary and some suggested discussion questions. Um, and the, it, the CSP oriented part is just we also mention which of the framework points that it aligns with. But um, other than that, it can be used any, for anything. Okay, so Cynthia has a question. Um, how do you introduce current affairs? Well, 
So this is Nicole. I usually do I, I usually do a discussion question as like a journal prompt at the beginning of class where I may share a video or I might have an article up that I want students to look at. Then they would journal about it and then we would do like an elbow or peer talk about it and then we would talk about it as a whole group. But I would give them specific kind of prompts that I would want them to reflect on or talk about with their neighbor so that they're using their time wisely with their neighbor. So I, uh, I, I try to follow along the, the same thing that Nicole does. I, I try to um, scaffold this. So I, I try to demonstrate to students how would I look for, you know, current, well, you know, what's ever happening within the, the current field of computing science or is there a story that's occurring? For example, the, in the past several months, we'd have a lot of uh, stories on cybersecurity you know, and um, there was uh, there was there was a lot of featured stories on on NPR in terms of uh, I think a DNS being uh, being attacked, and we and we and so I try to guide students into not only those kinds of stories but stories which are impacting the world at large in terms of, of computing, and and then on. on as, as as they started learning and seeing how I, I search for this, I, I do the same thing that Nic Nicole does. I, I I start having them search for stories, and then uh, in in the learning management system I use, we create a uh, a discussion forum, and I have kids come up with different topics, and they give a blurb about what they learned like the day before. And then we, they have kids go on and research it, and then they share their thoughts about what they think about the story. And I give them, like Nicole described, several prompts. You know, you know why? Why is that a computing innovation? You know, and, and that and that's something that's really important. A lot of my kids don't understand what makes a computing innovation a computing innovation. You know, they, they sometimes think that a, ro uh, a, a robot may be a computing innovation, but you want them to be able to describe, at least from the APCSP point of view, the data that's being processed through the innovation. And they, they can describe how the data is being, you know, inputted, what's, what's it capturing, what are the computer tools that is actually, you, you know, grabbing the data and transforming it to do something else, and what is the end result from coming through that. And... Uh, we actually went through an exercise about uh, learning about automatic license plate readers, the beneficial and harmful effects of that, and and that turned out to be a really lively discussion. So uh, I think what uh, Nicole's doing and Keisha's doing it really helps in in the same way that I'm doing, trying to always scaffold and guide kids into understanding how to research and introduce how computing affects kids in their lives at this time and age. And I would like to add on to what Art and Nicole have mentioned. Um, another thing I think it starts with is just modeling enthusiasm and excitement about current events. So typically at the beginning of the year, I will just share stories as they come forth, if, whether I read them or seen them on the news, to just draw forth conversation, which later on builds a climate that students want to share things that they have learned in regards to current events and innovations within technology. I do have slightly um, a larger time span with my students just based upon um, my school day because I see my students two and a half hours each day. So some discussions can go a little lengthy, um, which don't necessarily um, detriment the instructional time. But I do think just modeling that climate that knowing what's going on around us is just as important that students will then begin to implement and embody that within your classroom. So I'd like to um, start to wrap up here um, and say that thank you to our panelists for sharing their enthusiasm and great ideas um, for both the people that have been on this webinar, but also for those who are 
um, listening later and encourage you to consider attending upcoming activities. Um, on March 14th, there will be a webinar on funding and support for computer science. And on April 26th, uh, we'll have a webinar that will be focused again mostly on ECS and uh, computer science principles, but will certainly provide ideas for any courses uh, reflecting on the year that has just passed and, and things that we want to think about for next year. Thank you so much, Gail and Art and Keisha and Nicole. This has been quite informative. Um, we appreciate you all uh, coming and sharing your knowledge with others tonight. And thanks so much to all of our participants for joining us. We're glad to have you. We do hope you um, will join our community at csforallteachers.org if you're not already a member. And be sure to also follow us on Twitter um, with the handle on the screen there. So thank you all so much. And um, we look forward to seeing you again soon online sometime. Thanks all. Good night.